so welcome to our lesson today and we are going to look at hepatitis so we can define hepatitis as this is the condition of the endocrine system resulting into inflammation of the liver caused by drugs alcohol chemicals autoimmune diseases and viruses characterized by fever clay white stool dark urine uh, and basically other characteristics so when it comes to hepatitis basically you are going to see this condition resulting into inflammation of the liver so when the liver is inflamed you are going to see symptoms such as fever because there is uh, an infection let's say there is an infection causing this um, uh, this this condition uh, which results into initiation of an autoimmune response meaning you are going to see fever rising up because there is inf uh, infection and apart from infection inflammatory response also results into uh, fever then the other thing is that you are going to see dark urine so because the, the, the liver is going to be affected uh, the end products of red blood cells, the conjugated end products of red blood cells are not going to be added to urine, which is the bilirubin, won't be added to urine to give it color. Apart from that, you are going to have uh, clay whites too. You, need, you know that after bilirubin is absorbed, you need stercobilinogen to add color to the stool. So because the liver is affected, it may not be able to conjugate bilirubin and then uh, the end products of bilirubin wouldn't be uh, passed on to the urine or to the stool to give them color. So you are going to see those clinical manifestations in the patient and then uh, you, you, you see those things happening in a patient or uh, clinical manifestations in a patient. So when we look at uh, hepatitis, there are a lot of types of hepatitis. The first thing is that there is a toxic hepatitis, which can be caused by toxins, accumulation of toxins in the body. Apart from that, we have autoimmune hepatitis, meaning this is being initiated by the uh, normal body, the, the body antibodies attacking the, the normal body cells. So it can be due to an autoimmune response where the body begins to attack itself and then end up destroying liver cells. Apart from that, we have drug-induced hepatitis, meaning this hepatitis can be caused by maybe overuse of certain drugs. Apart from that, we have the common ones which we all know, which is hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis D, hepatitis C, and hepatitis C. E. However, when it comes to hepatitis, the common ones are hepatitis A, B, and C. So basically this evening or today we are going to focus on these three types of hepatitis and then we might just uh, look at the other two which is D and E and how they can come about. So hepatitis A, uh, B, and C are the ones that we are going to focus on. So then we can start looking at hepatitis A. So hepatitis A, uh, this is basically caused by hepatitis A virus. So a hepatitis A as a type of hepatitis, it is caused by hepatitis A virus, which is a RNA or a ribonucleic acid picona virus. So hepatitis A is, got, is caused by hepatitis A virus, uh, which is also called RNA picona virus. So it, it is caused by the ribonucleic acid picona virus. So picona virus is P I C O R N A V I R U S, which is P I C O R N A V I R U S. Uh, RNA picona virus and the incubation period um, of hepatitis A is about two to six weeks meaning once you're infected with the hepatitis A virus you might not manifest the symptoms within the period of um, uh, within the period of two to six weeks you might not manifest those uh, those symptoms but afterwards then you might manifest the clinical manifestations of uh, hepatitis A virus. How is hepatitis A virus spread? So it is ba basically spread through the oral fecal 
root. So hepatitis A is spread through oral fecal root, meaning this hepatitis A, for example, it can be spread uh, through food that are prepared, uh, food uh, that are not properly prepared, or where the the water that is used to prepare that food is contaminated with hepatitis A virus. Patients who don't uh, frequently wash hands, maybe you get in touch with a, a, a with an individual who has hepatitis A. Then you don't wash your hands, you end up ingesting food. Then you might ingest uh, the the food with. Um, containing hepatitis A. Uh, the other way we have talked of uh, the water. Water can be contaminated with feces of a patient who has uh, hepatitis A. Then you may end up transmitting that infection to another individual. So that is what is mean, it means when they say um, oral fecal root, meaning you have to ingest the hepatitis A virus for it to cause harm to your body. So the other thing is that um, apart from that you might get in contact with maybe uh, for women who have babies as you are changing the diapers and this baby has hepatitis A. So if you change the diapers and you don't clean yourself properly after changing the, the diapers it might be a mode of transmission uh, through which hepatitis A virus can find itself into a human being. Okay, this means this is because the fecal residues might remain in your nails, and when you keep long nails, it might end up remaining in the nails, and then you might ingest it as you are ingesting other foods. So when it comes to hepatitis, eh, what are the possible outcomes when you some when someone suffers from hepatitis? Eh? So uh, when someone suffers from hepatitis A, there's a, there's a chance that it might just clear up on its own without any treatment in a few weeks or months with no serious after effects. So hepatitis A might clear up on its own without any treatment and then this might clear without, without any treatment for about a few, few months or just few weeks after getting infected without even serious after effects. The other thing is that once this patient is, has recovered from hepatitis A, yeah, this patient is then immune for life for hepatitis A virus, meaning this individual can never suffer from hepatitis A virus. So if you, uh, for example, if you suffer from hepatitis A virus, the body is going to develop immunoglobulin G antibodies specifically for hepatitis A virus, meaning you can never suffer from hepatitis A virus so it is basically there is a high chance that when you suffer from it you are immune for life and which is a good thing so when it comes to the pathophysiology of hepatitis A, it's basically very short so an infected individual is going to come into contact with them so an infected individual uh, or basically an individual is going to ingest contents of foods contaminated with hepatitis A virus. So once this ingestion occurs, the hepatitis virus will then invade the liver cells, taking hostage of the liver cells and destroying them after reproducing. So once the, the, the hepatitis A virus take, invades the liver cells, they are going to invade them and then as they are reproducing they rupture those red blood cells and then they reproduce more hepatitis virus you know how a virus works it's going to attack a red blood cells go to the nucleus of the red blood cells reproduce and then they rupture that red blood cells then they, therefore afterwards the body then will attack the hepatitis virus with antibodies this will furthermore lead to the destruction, regeneration, and resuming of normal function of the, of the liver. A person who recovers from hepatitis A virus becomes then immune for life. So because of presence of the virus, it attacks the liver cells, ruptures them, reproduces. After reproducing, the body now initiates an, an immune response to hepatitis virus. They attack the viruses. So once as they are attacking the viruses, they lead to destruction of the liver tissue. After the liver tissue is destroyed, regeneration can then 
occur also. Generation can occur whereby the body tries to bring the, the liver tissue to its normal, back to its normal function. Uh, and then also resuming of normal function can occur of the liver. So hepatitis A has a higher chance of uh, an individual suffering from hepatitis A has a higher chance of uh, the liver recovering and then returning to normal uh, functioning. Uh, unlike other types of um, hepatitis and this person will basically remain immune for life. So that is basically how the pathophysiology of hepatitis A occurs. So uh, apart from that we can now look at hepatitis B. Okay, so we can look at hepatitis B. So hepatitis B, this basically results into uh, inflammation of the liver. And this results into inflammation of the liver, and this inflammation of the liver is caused by the hepatitis B virus, which is a DNA hepa, hepativirus, hepativirus, which is a DNA hepativirus. So when, it, when, we, when we compare it with the hepatitis A, you realize that in hepatitis A, this was being caused by uh, RNA picona virus, but hepatitis B, it is goes, it is caused by hepatitis B virus, which is part of the DNA hepatide virus. So hepatide virus is H-E-P-A-D-E-V-I-R-U-S, and this results in two liver cell damage. This results in two liver cell damage. So once the damage occurs in hepatitis B virus, it can result in two scarring of the liver or basically what we call cirrhosis. So it can even result in two liver cirrhosis, which is scarring of the liver. Of the liver. And then it may increase the risk of uh, liver cancer in some individuals. So hepatitis B virus is even more dangerous than hepatitis A. So how can hepatitis B virus transmitted to from one person to another individual? The first thing is that through unprotected sex. So individuals basically they worry about the HIV virus but you forget that there is hepatitis virus which can be transmitted through unprotected sexual intercourse. So when penetration occurs, some, some uh, when penetration occurs with an individual who is uh, positive for hepatitis, it can they can transmit it from one person to the other, uh, meaning uh, the next person becomes infected. The other way that hepatitis B virus can be shared from one individual to the other is through sharing contaminated needles or other drugs injecting equipment. So you have individuals who basically thrive on con uh, controlled drugs and then they inject themselves drugs when they are sharing a needle they might share hepatitis virus. This is because hepatitis virus mainly has to find its way to direct to the blood. That's why even through sexual intercourse if you, you um, if you injure yourself and then <clears throat> there is contact of blood between two individuals, then you can share the virus. The other way is that uh, it is through use of uh, unsterilized equipment. You will realize that uh, uh, tattooing, so tattooing, they basically use unsterilized equipment. They never sterilize those stuff. Spirit cannot sterilize a tattoo instrument it can only decontaminate it and you cannot kill a virus through decontamination you can only kill it through sterilization body piercings ladies who like to go piercing ears it might be shared from one person to the other then the other way it can be transmitted is from an infected mother to a baby so during delivery this may occur so it may be transmitted from the mother to the baby. That's why uh, immunization of the baby from hepatitis B is very important. Remember, on, uh, among the immunization schedule, there is a DPT, HEP-B, and HEP-B. So it means 
basically they try to prevent hepatitis B as much as possible. The other mode of transmission of hepatitis B is through blood transfusion. In, so uh, in blood transfusion you realize that the only virus which is mainly screened is the, the HIV virus. The other things are, are basically left out, meaning these individuals who, who get blood with hepatitis from an individual who suffered from hepatitis B, they can easily suffer from the same condition which is hepatitis B. So basically that's how uh, that's how hepatitis B can be transmitted from one individual to the other. And basically when it comes to the incubation period of uh, hepatitis B is, is for about from uh, about 4 to 24 weeks. So in between 4 to 24 weeks that is the basically the incubation period of uh, uh, of uh, hepatitis B, meaning someone can just have the incubation period of, of four weeks and begin to manifest uh, symptoms. And another individual whose immune system probably is strong, they can even go up to the actual 24 weeks for them to just even begin to manifest uh, symptoms of the condition. So basically that is the incubation period of uh, hepatitis uh, B and uh, its mode of uh, transmission. So basically, an individual who is uh, infected with hepatitis A virus, some individuals may uh, may uh, may experience uh, acute phase of the of the condition, uh, which is basically just short term, and this mainly occurs shortly after exposure to the virus, and uh, the patient may the individual may experience symptoms of uh, hepatitis A virus. But this uh, this basically is very severe and mon ma mostly life threatening. So if an individual experiences the acute phase of hepatitis A, this one is very severe and mostly life threatening. That's why sometimes it is called the fulminant hepatitis. It is very very deadly. It means this person the chances of survival are less. But some individual may experience a chronic phase of uh, uh, of hepatitis, meaning this hepatitis infection may last even for about six months from the time the patient or the individual began to experience the symptoms of uh, the condition. And once hepatitis B becomes a chronic condition where it is prolonged in this individual, it may never go away completely even if the patient regains uh, stability from the disease. It may never go away completely, so it means the chances of them transmitting to the next individual are still high even after treatment. So basically that is what happens. We can now look at the pathophysiology of hepatitis B virus. So when it comes to the pathophysiology, basically uh, due to presence of uh, hepatitis B virus in the body, it will result into diffuse inflammatory infiltration of the hepatic tissue with the, the mononuclear cells. So due to presence of the hepatitis B virus, it will result into diffuse inflammatory infiltration of the uh, hepatic tissue with the mononuclear cells, uh, resulting in two also singular or spotty necrosis. So the inflammation is going to occur in the liver, which is going to be diffuse, meaning it is going to affect the bigger portion or the entire portion of the liver. And this this inflammatory response may, inflammatory response may uh, may be in terms of spotty or singular necrosis, meaning they may have patches which are still normal and other patches which are affected from this hepatitis B virus. So this will therefore then result into swelling of the liver. This will then result into swelling of the liver. Inflammation and regeneration will then occur simultaneously, distorting the normal lobular pattern and creating pressure within and around the portal vein and obstructing the normal bowel channels. 
This will therefore increase toxicity in the liver and the entire body. What we are trying to say is that uh, the, when the virus, hepatitis B virus, attacks the, 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 the body or in this human being, it, uh, it attacks the liver, it results into inflammation. And this inflammation basically is going to affect the hepatic tissue, meaning this is the liver tissue, which is then going to, to result in two mononuclear cells being uh, inflamed. You are going to see on under the microscope spotty and also singular necrosis, which may be sprayed to the entire liver tissue. This will then, because there is this inflammation, this, it is going to result in two swelling. Rem remember under the inflammatory uh, process, the stages of inflammation, swelling is part of it. So it is going to result in two swelling of this uh, liver. Once this swelling occurs, it is going to be um, happening simultaneously with the regeneration. Remember regeneration, the, the liver tissue will try to recreate itself and return to its normal functioning. But this is going to be happening simultaneously. Here inflammation is occurring, regeneration is occurring. Once regeneration starts on this, uh, stops on this uh, body tissue, uh, it uh, goes to the other side then. Uh, inflammation is also occurring so it is more like going to be a lose-lose situation you are trying to fix something and something is destroying what you are trying to fix so because these two things are happening simultaneously it results into distorting the normal lobular pattern so the lobes become distorted and how they are supposed to function this will then create pressure within and around the hepatic portal vein so when there is pressure around the hepatic portal vein, it means the liver cannot perform its normal function. And then the hepatic portal vein will in turn obstruct the normal bowel channels, meaning instead of the bowel ducts releasing whatever toxins are being produced in the body, they are being compressed or obstructed, meaning they cannot release those toxins. And then the toxins are going to end up building up in the liver and also back into the body, increasing toxicity in the body. So basically that is how the pathophysiology of, um, of, uh, of hepatitis B occurs. Okay. okay, so we can look at hepatitis C. So hepatitis C, basically this results into inflammation of the liver which is caused by hepatitis C virus. So hepatitis C virus is a, f uh, a member of the Flaviviridae family, which is a virus, which is a virus which is part of the RNA viruses. So the hepatitis C virus is caused by uh, a virus which is a member of the Flaviviridae family viruses. So Flaviviridae is F L a V I V I R I D A E family of viruses which are RNA viruses. The mode of transmission of hepatitis C virus is basically spread through shared needles among drug abusers. Apart from that is through blood transfusion which is almost similar to hepatitis B. During hemodialysis, remember hemodialysis, when they are doing dialysis, a patient with renal function doing dialysis, there is peritoneal dialysis and the hemodialysis. So hemodialysis, uh, where they have punctured directly the, the, blood, uh, the, the blood vessels, it can result into introduction of uh, the hepatitis C viruses. So through unprotected sex with an infected person, you can transmit hepatitis C virus. So hepatitis C virus has the is, um, same clinical manifestations as hepatitis B. That's why even when it comes to, uh, to management of hepatitis C or prevention of, of hepatitis C, it will be the same as hepatitis C uh, B, including its pathophysiology. It is going to result into inflammation of the liver cells, uh, in the similar manner that hepatitis B virus would do.
cause. So basically when it comes to hepatitis, the, the, the only common ones are hepatitis A and hepatitis B. The others are not so common and are not so major, major types of hepatitis. But when it comes to hepatitis C infection, it basically evolves. Uh, it basically evolves hepatitis C. C. So you realize that someone infected with hepatitis C virus, they just spontaneously recover from the virus. Uh, and uh, most of them, they don't develop even chronic uh, liver disease or damage to the liver. So basically, patients with chronic, with the chronic hepatitis C infection, they, they are the only ones who are a bit at uh, risk of developing uh, liver cirrhosis or liver failure or liver cancer. But patients who suffer from acute phase of hepatitis C, they uh, recover mainly even without any treatment and they just spontaneously recover and how it happens, it is not known, but however, it could be because the liver tries as much as possible to regenerate the dead or the inflamed liver tissue. So basically that is what happens to uh, hepatitis, C, hepatitis C patients. Then when it comes to the other types like hepatitis D, so hepatitis D also causes serious liver problems. However, for hepatitis D to occur, an individual should have already have hepatitis B virus in the blood. So hepatitis D cannot occur on its own because it needs presence of the hepatitis B virus. That's how it can occur. When, then when it comes to hepatitis E, when it comes to hepatitis E, basically hepatitis E causes uh, an acute infection of the liver. And uh, this basically is not even uh, so severe because it doesn't even lead to the chronic phase of, hepat of the hepatitis. It doesn't uh, affect the individual that much. It just causes some acute infection or acute illness, which might be a bit hard or unbearable, but... Uh, it is able to clear out without major, major uh, problems. Basically, when it comes to its transmission, it is uh, uh, ingestion of fecal contents. So someone has to ingest food uh, containing feces that have been contaminated with uh, hepatitis or feces passed from an individual of hepatitis C E. And then uh, other things like uh, poor sanitation where someone uh, ingests water containing hepatitis E virus. So basically when it comes to the types, we have the only two major types, which is hepatitis A and B. The others, they are minimal and, and they mainly rely on presence of the other two in the body for them to manifest uh, symptoms. Okay, so when it comes to clinical manifestation, clinical manifestation are going to basically relate to uh, liver problems. So in any condition that uh, where the liver is being affected, you expect the clinical manifestation uh, that relate to liver problem to arise from that individual. So we can talk of uh, jaundice. So jaundice, this is uh, due to impaired excretion of conjugated bilirubin. So jaundice is due to impaired excretion of uh, conjugated bilirubin. Then uh, lethargy, a patient may also be lethargic. So lethargy is due to increased bilirubin levels in the blood. So it's due to increase bilirubin levels in the blood. So bilirubin is not supposed to be found just in the blood in higher levels. Um, if it is found in higher level, it is resulting to toxicity of the blood, which is which basically causes lethargy. So apart from jaundice and also lethargy, what other symptoms can we see? So you, you are going to see the patient experiencing uh, abdominal pain. So severe abdominal pain, this is basically due to inflammation, inflammation of the Glinson's capsule surrounding the liver. So uh, abdominal pain is due to inflammation of the glin, 
glycine's capsule surrounding the liver okay then you are going to also see fever fever due this is due to pyogen uh, inflammatory process which results in fever is due to release of pyogenes in inflammatory process fever is due to release of pyogenes in inflammatory process so during the inflammatory process pyogenes are released which results into fever okay then pruritus so pruritus is the basically due to increased bowel salt accumulation in the skin pruritus is basically due to uh, bowel salt accumulation in the skin then uh, uh, apart from that the patient might also have clinical manifestations such as bleeding tendencies so increased bleeding uh, tendencies this is due to reduced prothrombin synthesis you know, in the liver remember the hepatic cells are supposed to to produce prothrombin so if the hepatic cells are injured, it means even prothrombin production is reduced, meaning this patient or individual can easily bleed. Okay. So basically we have more than five clinical manifestations and how that's how they can manifest in an individual or those are the uh, signs and symptoms that you may see in an individual with hepatitis. Then when it comes to management, okay, so when it comes to management, we can start with medical management. So during investigations, you realize that in, during history taking, the patient will have history of maybe passing uh, dark urine or clay white stool. When, and then on the physical examination, the patient who's going to be jaundiced. So during your physical examination, you find that the patient is in, Join this, so they will have presence of yellowish discoloration of the mucous membranes and also the sclera. Then, apart from that, you can uh, you can do um, other investigations such as uh, a liver function test. So, a liver function test is going to show presence of uh, degeneration of hepatic cells or degenerated hepatic cells or affected hepatic cells you can do urinalysis and urinalysis is going to show increased urobilinogen you can do uh, a liver biopsy to isolate the causative organism so basically you can do do those uh, tests to to confirm the diagnosis when it comes to management of hepatitis so management of hepatitis you consider it as an infectious condition meaning you are going to nurse this patient away from the others so oh, basically we need to talk about the medication so when it comes to medication in hepatitis uh, the first thing is that you can give um, uh, you, you can give uh, prednisolone so you can give prednisolone 30 milligrams once daily for about 14 for about 7 to 14 days so you can give it for 7 days you can give it up to 14 days after that you then discontinue the drug or you can give vitamin B complex so if you're giving vitamin B complex that's about 100 to 200,000 international units or you can give vitamin A 10 milligrams IM as start doses. Apart from that, in presence of pain, you can prescribe an analgesic like Panadol 500 milligrams three times a day for about five days, three to five days. So, but when it comes to drugs, um, basically hepatitis has no specific drugs, but you'll be treating it symptoms so it is you do symptomatic eh, treatment apart from that some patients also experience uh, nausea and vomiting in hepatitis meaning you can prescribe fenegan 10 milligram as a start dose whenever the symptom is eh, present so that you uh, fenegan is an anti-emetic eh, drug so that you reduce eh, uh, the, the the feeling of nausea or the actual vomiting. Then when it comes to nursing management, when it comes to nursing management for 
hepatitis, you are going to consider it as an infectious condition, meaning you need to isolate the patient, infection prevention measures. Apart from that, then you can bring in other headings. Uh, you can bring in other headings from um, a profanum, like uh, you can skip even the the the, the what the uh, the environment because you'd have used the points for environment in infection prevention measures and also isolation. So you can skip to uh, maybe psychological care. Apart from psychological care, talk about observations. Uh, then also hygiene, which is important. You need to do hygiene. Apart from hygiene, nutrition. So uh, you can bring in nutrition as a heading in this condition. Uh, bring in medication as the, as the nursing management need to make sure that, that the patient is taking medication whenever symptoms eh, arises and you mention the same medications that you have mentioned in medical management and then you can talk about elimination because there is, the liver is affected you need to ensure that the patient is now uh, passing normal uh, urine color and also normal color of feces so basically when it comes to um, hepatitis you consider it as an infectious eh, condition so you manage the patient with hepatitis just like you can manage any other infectious condition okay so basically this is where we are going to end with hepatitis hepatitis is not a difficult or major condition but it is important that we know it and because we have an infectious um, condition around us it's better we also understand better how to manage infectious conditions so as you are studying make sure you you learn a lot how you can manage an infectious condition it couldn't be coronavirus but just any other infectious disease it is going to help you if such an infectious condition was brought thank you so much for going through this tutorial video and uh, be sure to watch out for the other tutorial videos in other courses study well Okay.